Good evening. My name is Anat Sultan Dodon and I am the Consul General of Israel to the Southeast US. On behalf of the consulate and our partners, I am pleased to welcome all of you to the launch of our new web series, Against All Hate. Our hope is that this series will provide the space and opportunity to discuss and contribute to combating hatred and bigotry in all forms. We will be focusing this evening on anti-Semitism and racism, which are sadly ever relevant. And I'm looking forward to tonight's discussion of these important issues as we are privileged to have with us truly incredible panelists. Thank you for joining us. Good evening. There's an African proverb that says if the lions don't tell their stories, the hunters will get all the credit. I'm telling you the story now because you're a young lion and lionesses. That's much better. <laughs> Let's try it again. Sierra? Good evening again. I'm Sierra Weiss, Director of Academic Affairs and Jewish Community Relations at the Israeli Consulate in Atlanta. And I'm Wendell Shelby Wallace, the Consulate's Director of External Affairs. The consulate is excited to bring to you some amazing panelists. The first part of our discussion about the intersection of racism and anti-Semitism will consist of three moderated sections, the words, the works, and the worth. Joining us is Rabbi Sandra Lawson, who is currently serving as the Associate Chaplain for Jewish Life and a Senior Jewish Educator at Hillel at Elon University in Elon, North Carolina. Rabbi Lawson received ordination from the Reconstructionist Rabbinical College in June 2018. She has served as a military police person with the US Army, personal trainer, college instructor, and an investigative researcher with the ADL. She is also a writer for the Jewish publication, The Forward. Rabbi Sandra's vision as a rabbi is to help build a more inclusive Jewish community where all who want to come are welcome. Diversity is embraced and we can come together to learn and to pray. Dr. Deborah Lipstadt, Dorot Professor of Holocaust Studies at Emory University in Atlanta, has published and taught about the Holocaust and anti-Semitism for close to 40 years. Professor Lipstadt's book, Anti-Semitism Here and Now, has just been published with stellar reviews and been awarded the National Jewish Book Award. She is frequently called upon by the Congress of the United States to testify and consult on contemporary anti-Semitism and is frequently quoted in the New York Times, Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, Forward, and Tablet. She regularly appears on BBC, CNN, NPR, and PBS, among many other publications. And Dr. Elizabeth Ro Robertson Hornsby is an assistant professor and graduate coordinator in the Department of Communications and Media Studies at Southeastern Louisiana University. She teaches classes in communication studies and media studies with a focus on cultural competency, information literacy, and media management, and has over a decade of experience in online learning. Her research interests include exploring intersections of communication, culture, media, and technology from a critical perspective. Now, Sierra, that's a panel. <laughs> and as I look at over 100 of you who joined us um, on Zoom and those of you who are joining us on Facebook Live, I can also see that we have an amazing audience. Um, and as we celebrate Black Jewish Unity Week, um, it's important that tonight's conversation be fully engaging. So throughout the conversation, feel free to type any questions that you may have in um, using the Q&A feature. Um, it should be located at the bottom portion of your screen. Um, and we'll take a moment to answer any question, uh, as many questions as possible towards the end of the programming. Um, and those that we cannot get to, um, we'll be sure to respond to you via email. All right, but before we begin tonight, um, 
our, before we get, begin tonight's discussion and bring our panelists online, um, let's take a, a quick look at these words of wisdom um, shared by Maya Angelou during, during Oprah Winfrey's uh, mastery course. Words are things, I'm convinced. You must be careful about the words you use or the words you allow to be used in your house. In the Old Testament, we are told in Genesis that in the beginning was the word. And the word was God and the word was with God. That's in Genesis. Words are things. You must be careful. Careful about calling people out of their names, using racial pejoratives and sexual pejoratives and all that ignorance. Don't do that. Someday we'll be able to measure the power of words. I think they are things. I think they get on the walls. They get in your wallpaper. They get in your rugs, in your upholstery, in your clothes, and finally into you. So let's welcome um, our panelists for this evening, Rabbi Sandra Lawson, Dr. Deborah Lipstadt, and Dr. Elizabeth Hornsby. I'm aboard. Awesome, awesome, awesome. It, again, it's such a privilege to have all of you here um, tonight for tonight's discussion, um, and we're hoping that it's one that's very um, engaging um, for our audience. Um, I'll start with you, Dr. Hornsby. Um, a lot of your work explores the intersections of, of communication, culture, media, and technology from a cultural perspective. Um, how important is it for all of us as we're talking through tonight's discussion and as we start having these type of discussions, um, that we have the same understanding when we're speaking of terms like hate, racism, anti-Semitism, intersectionality, white privilege, oppression, et cetera. Um, well, first of all, I want to um, thank you for having me. I am really, truly, as I was reading through the bios, thinking like, what am I doing on this panel? <laughs> I just want to listen <laughs> um, because really, truly the work of my fellow panelists is, is moving in, in so many ways. But, I think it's really important to situate oneself in the discourse. Um, so as we come into discussions about hate and racism and antisemitism, it's helpful to recognize and articulate what histories and experiences and language you are bringing with you as you enter into the conversation. And so for me, thinking about the intersections of communication, culture, media, and technology, as well as the intersections of my own histories as a Black woman raised by two middle-class parents in the South, raised in a evangelical non-denominational Christian home, um, raised in a racial rec reconciliation era. All of that informs my understanding of terms like hate and racism. Um, so knowing that is really important. So, but in terms of communication, thinking about how do I situate myself as both a creator and a consumer of messages is really helpful. Um, for example, what messages have I created that sort of inform my understanding of hate, right? Like, um, and understanding that creation and consumption occurs at multiple levels, that it occurs, occurs intrapersonally, so the things that are in our brain, and that's where we see prejudices and stereotypes, and I know we're gonna get into that later, um, but that it's not just intrapersonal messaging, that is also interpersonal, so in our relationships, how are the messages around terms like you mentioned, hate, racism, how are those messages created and consumed organizationally? And then it just breaks out societally, culturally. So the where is really important, I think, but also the how, right? So how these messages are created um, and consumed, especially within the context of media. Um, a lot of my work focuses on social media, um, I don't know who in communication is not looking at social media right now, um, but, all, but also in other forms of media, uh, television, movies, magazines, 
how are the messages that help us sort of understand the language both created and consumed? Um, and then how does technology affect that, right? So technology is not just a medium, but it shapes the media, right? Um, we don't, a lot of people don't read newspapers, they read the newspaper on their phone. A lot of people don't go to the, to the magazine stand and get a magazine or pick one up from the grocery store, they read a digital magazine. And how does that affect our sort of understanding of, of language and, and communication. So it's how one is exposed to and then chooses to enter into the discourse that's really understand, uh, that's really important to understand. So to encapsulate the complexity of language for me, especially in contested spaces where discourse about racism, anti-Semitism, anti hate, white supremacy tend to live, thinking about communication, culture, media, and technology critically, always thinking about power is really important. And I think if we can always be aware and honor how someone enters into these conversations and all the things that they bring into them, then it, it can give us a sort of solid starting point to then to begin to discuss how do we um, promote change and, and justice and equality. So um, as we t get ourselves into this, this particular section of tonight's programming where we're talking about the words um, and, and the question that uh, Dr. Hornsby um, uh, answered, answered so well, um, I want you, the audience, um, to use a chat box to define hate in your own terms. What does hate look like for you? What does it mean? Um, because oftentimes we talk about hate and, and all of us have, have different definitions of it. So, um, start pouring out your responses. Um, start pouring out your responses um, into the chat box. Um, and while you are pouring out your responses, um, we'll go ahead and and ask a few more questions of our lovely panelists that we have tonight. Great. Thank you, everyone who's already responded. And as the the questions continue to come in, I'd like to ask Rabbi Sandra and Dr. Lipstadt, how would you define prejudice? Uh, do you think it's separate from hate? And what forms of prejudice do you deal with in your work? Dr. Lipstadt, you're on mute still. Yes, yes. There you go. Go ahead, Rabbi. I think. Yes, yeah. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, so first of all, thank you all. Thank you so much for, for having me here. and. Uh, you know, one of the uh, the blessings of this time period is that I get to uh, to connect with people um, that I wouldn't have necessarily had the opportunity to connect with. And I know your question was about prejudice, and you know, prejudice is about prejudging, you know, having biases and things like that, which I know we'll get into differently, into getting to get into soon. But I also want to be clear that prejudice is a is, racism is a prejudice, but racism is a, is a, is a system, you know, designed to privilege one group of people over another group of people, um, you know, but is prejudice a form of hate? So if I, you know, if I make, if I prejudge you, so let's just use a real example, you know, it, like, you know, uh, Mr. Um, George Floyd, you know, had a $20 bill. Um, who knows if he knew that it was counterfeit or not, um, and who knows what the clerk was thinking when they called the police, but let's just, let's just say maybe the clerk had some prejudgment about that person and that prejudgment, as we know, left, led to his death. And so we all prejudge things. We all have prejudices. We all have biases because we are part of a system. It's in our, it's, we live in a country that from the very founding was designed to privilege one group of people over another. So when we all have to at least not acknowledge that we have some preconceived ideas and some prejudices towards people. Um, let me pick up on that and maybe even go back a little bit. Uh, as uh, the rabbi just said, prejudice, the etymology of the word prejudge, don't confuse me with the facts I've made up my mind. I see you, I know what you are and who you are. If you're Jewish, you're rich, if you're black, you're poor, you're shady, you got here on special privilege. If you're gay, you're effeminate. If you're a gay man, you're effeminate. If you're a, a, a gay woman, you're butch, whatever it might be. Um, 
I, I know who you are. So that's, I think, uh, the one important thing. And I think another point, building on what the rabbi just said, is that prejudice can come off in a positive manner. Mm -hmm. um, he uh, uh, says the senior partner in a law firm, I just hired an Orthodox Jew as an associate, but he's very honest. Or I just hired a uh, black woman uh, to, to run the office, uh, and she's very articulate, you know, it's, or but she's very, usually it's a but. Um, so that you can sound like you're giving a compliment, but the supposition is that um, this person is different, which is why I would guess that both Rabbi Lawson and Professor Hornsby and I all cringe when we hear someone say, some of my best friends are. That's an expression of prejudice, because what you're saying, you're boasting. And I'll, I'll just close this part with an anecdote. When I was a kid, I don't know, nine, 10 years old, whatever, I went into a hardware store. We used to have those before we had Home Depot and Lowe's you know, Ace or whatever. My father had to buy something, I think it was for the synagogue, for building the sukkah at the synagogue, whatever it was. Uh, in his question, it became clear that he was Jewish. And the man said, oh, Mr. Lipstadt, some of my best friends are Jews. And I just stood there and listened. As we walked out of the store, I said, isn't that nice, Daddy, that some of his best friends are Jews? And my father said something to me, which I didn't understand then, but now I understand very well. He said, you'll never hear someone boasting some of my best friends are white Anglo-Saxon Protestants. So in other words, you know, the minute you're boasting about it, you're doing one of two things or both things. Look at me, I'm so liberal, I'm so open-minded, I'm friendly with them or with some from that group, or I'm friendly with the good ones. Those are all rooted in prejudice, judging prejudice. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Lipstad and, and, and um, Rabbi Lawson. Um, you know, I, uh, this is an area that's really interesting to me, the, the topics of racism and intersectionality and, 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 and all of those things, um, not just because I'm a black man, but also because I, I, I consider myself a scholar in the work. Um, and so as someone who studies gender, sexuality, um, and differences, I was originally introduced to the term of intersectionality um, as a student at Morehouse. Um, and truthfully, I was surprised when I recently ran across pieces um, that, that um, or articles that discussed how um, intersectionality fails Jew Jewish women. Um, and, and so I want to hear from you all, you know, um, what exactly is intersectionality? Um, and is it possible that this term can be exclusive? Uh, you want me to, I'll, I'll just jump in. Um, intersectionality began with a very, very legitimate idea and at its root is a very legitimate thing. None of us is one thing. Uh, Elizabeth and I, uh, you're, Elizabeth is black, I'm white in case you didn't notice or whatever, um, but we're both professors, we're both women, everybody is different things. And my, my recollection is that it begins, so the term is first used or, or popularized in relation to a lawsuit brought by a group of black women who worked either for General Motors, one of the big auto companies, who sued, this goes back quite a few years, because they said they couldn't get, as women, they couldn't get the high paying jobs on the assembly line. And as black people, they couldn't get the good jobs in the front office. So their two identities were intersecting and preventing them from, and, 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 and resulting in a, a unique form of discrimination. Not one, not the other, but unique. Uh, Elizabeth, do I, got, do I have that right? Okay. Um, in terms of your second point about uh, how intersectionality has failed Jews, Jewish women, in, a very good concept was taken and the argument has been made in recent years, not by everyone who subscribes to it, but by many who subscribe to it, um, that uh, if you, if you, all people of prejudice bond together, and if you're not 
a person who is a sub object of prejudice, and many of these people would say Jews are not an object of prejudice, and we can talk about that in a, in a moment. Um, you are cut out. You can't claim uh, an identity of, of being an object of prejudice. It's become, uh, let me be a little clearer and, and more straightforward. It's become a cover in many respects for um, a hostility towards Israel, not disagreement with Israeli policies, because, you know, as, as uh, the Consul General can tell us, you go to uh, any place in Israel, read any newspaper, go to the Knesset, you hear disagreement with Israeli policies but in opposition to the existence of Israel and the targeting of all Jews uh, because of the perceived wrongs of Israel uh, that they can't be uh, victims. So um, that's sort of a general thing. And I'll stop here, Elizabeth. Professor Hornsby. Oh, Elizabeth is totally fine. Okay. Um, you know, I think you were spot on with sort of the history uh, or a history of intersectionality, I think you know, um, Dr. Crenshaw really, um, you know, it, it, it started in, in legal work, right? I mean, it started as sort of understanding discrimination and how it sort of operates uh, within our, our legal system. There are other scholars who work in intersectionality. Dr. Patricia um, Hill Collins works in, in intersectionality more from a sociological standpoint. Um, and it is, I don't want to say it's derivative because again, I think that intersectionality is, while we didn't have the phrase, we did have the um, sort of the, the movement of it in, in work, um, especially if you look at black feminist work uh, or feminist work in general, I think that, that we were always trying to understand maybe it was intersecting class and gender, not so much as race and gender, but I think there was always this sort of idea like we are not one thing and that because we are not one thing, we exist in this world in ways that uh, oppress us or um, hinder us from um, doing the things that we want to do. So we need to sort of look at those things, but you look at how Dr. Collins thinks about intersectionality uh, more as a complex understanding of social inequality and social injustice. And she really centers her work in power. Um, and this is, it can operate in a legal system, but it also operates in family systems. It operates in religious, in religious spaces. It operates in, in, in educational spaces, right? So then we start to see this term of intersectionality be deployed outside of how it was maybe popularized by Crenshaw in 1990, we'd start to see it pop up in other places. I think what happened was it started to pop up in, in diversity and inclusion trainings, and it, it, it became general. Um, it became less about um, really understanding discrimination. I mean, I've, I've heard and read sort of deployments of intersectionality that completely removed that we are looking at oppression and discrimination, not just we all have intersecting identities and that's the end of it, but really how does, then that, how does that affect um, pursuits and projects of equity and justice? Um, and, and, then, and, and so then that's when we start to see the, see the criticisms of it, right? Because now you go to a college classroom and you may have uh, a professor who is using a very broad approach of intersectionality and the, the students say, well, this doesn't really apply to me. And I feel like because I cannot claim an oppressed identity or a victim identity, therefore you are targeting me. And, and what is interesting in, in about this call and about actually that word is that the cultural Marxist myth that is uh, attached to intersectionality is anti-Semitic right? Like it comes from an anti-Semitic um, theory that the Jews came to Columbia University to destroy America through, they couldn't do it through economic Marxism, so they had cultural Marxism. And that's what critical theory is. And out of critical theory comes critical race theory, comes intersectionality, comes feminist theory. And then we get to what we saw last week, which was a banning of these, a mass banning of terms, because it is, it is, it is Marxist. And so I think we have to, again, that's why I say how you enter into a conversation is really important in understanding your um, meaning making of those terms because for a lot of people, they did not enter into the understanding of intersectionality through Crenshaw's legal work or even through Collins. They entered in it through a contested space 
where it was always back, I was already backed up against this idea that it's not real and it's it's a destruction of what it is identity politics. It is Absolutely. political correctness, right? And so you cannot embrace. As a matter of fact, and I'll end on this. I think I read a Vox article from 2019 where Ben Shapiro, who is you know known for his uh, criticisms specifically of woke liberal leftist political agendas is given Crenshaw's legal definition and sort of um, explanation of what intersectionality is. And he says, I actually don't have a problem with this. I have a problem with how it has been reiterated in college classrooms and in these trainings. I actually don't have a problem with this definition. And if that is not sort of a picture of how language shifts and change and, and, and meanings and understandings can be flattened and generalized and weaponized in some ways, um, I, I don't know what it is. Because when he was presented with factual information as to how this was written in a legal brief, there was no, oh, I get that, yeah, makes sense. And so I think that's really sort of important uh, to think about when you are um, discussing these terms is that sometimes how they were originally intended is not how they are interpreted today. Thank you so much um, for, for such well articulated answers to that question. Um, we have one last question for you all about words and then we'll move on into our next section um, about uh, the works that we're doing. Rabbi Sandra, you look like you were about to say something, so I'll let you get your word in and then I'll, I'll ask the next question. My apologies. I, I didn't mean to cut you off. First of all, you got to let the rabbi talk. <laughs> <laughs> Loving this. I just want to go back to school for a little bit. Uh, this is really awesome. And I love what Deborah had to say and Elizabeth had to say. And I just I feel like I could sort of write, provide maybe a, a little more of a practical explanation. So like how I understand, I mean, I agree with everything that was, was said, but just to add, you know, like, the you know intersectionality is sort of this like interlocking system of power that affects like really mar most the most marginalized people in our society and how it plays out for me um and you know the best examples of, we can often give our own examples so i'm queer lgbtq I identified um and i'm also black and, and i'm jewish and so so many communities that that um and, it, and specifically in the Jewish community are not, don't consider themselves homophobic nor that they consider themselves racist. But the fact that my two identities interlock um, really calls into questions people's own understanding of their own biases and their own prejudice. And often that comes off, can come off quite hostile. And so I really think many in the, as, as, our, as the Jewish community becomes more racially, ethnically diverse, Jewish communities really need to do the internal work on, um, on the inter intersectionality of people, because if you haven't realized it now, um, but every rabbinical school, right, every progressive rabbinical school, so reform, um, for Aleph, uh, reform, reconstructionist and conservative movements all have black students in them right now. And so it's time for many communities to do the work, but I just wanted to add my two cents to this amazing, amazing conversation. Wonderful, thank you so much for that addition. Um, in continuing with defining some of the words we'll be using throughout this conversation, um, I wanted to ask all of you to, uh, what are stereotypes and why do you think stereotypes gain traction and what can we do to mitigate stereotyping? I, I guess I'll, um, I'll try to attempt to answer this. I think that, you know, I've, I've luckily been traveling the world via Zoom these days talking to Jewish communities. And I think, you know, as we, you know, are, and many of us are, are, are in lockdown or coming out of lockdown and we're watching protest sort of uh, people protesting in the street and people are sort of coming to this reckoning, like what's wrong with Thomas Jefferson and what's wrong with, you know, uh, are the founders of our country. And, you know, as I said earlier, we really need to understand the narratives that we tell about people, um, you know, yes, Je Thomas Jefferson uh, was the, one of the founders of our country, but he also owned slaves. Same with George Washington. And we have to understand how these stereotypes have benefited our society. So for, you know, black people were brought here um, as property, as slaves, and slaves. Um, and st the stereotypes that we've created um, around black people, if you think about it, um, 
often about capitalism, just like many of the stereotypes that we have about Jews or about scapegoating, and we see that being played out right now. And if we can really start to tell true whole narratives of the founding of our country and the true whole narratives of how our country has benefited one group of people, and that is a moving target um, as people, different people assimilated into whiteness, we can actually then, I believe, start to, to understand stereotypes and how they have benefited some people and hurt people and help people, you know, and, um, and I think that we will be better off, but we're going to have to go through this, this period of reckoning. Uh, but I really think just going back and really looking at where these stereotypes come from, you know, I grew up and people would tell me all the time, I don't sound black and I didn't understand what, what that meant. Um, and I had luckily strong black parents, um, you know, that tell, told me I didn't have to try to fit into uh, what everybody thought I should be. Um, and, and when you have a teacher tell, telling you that you don't, you, you're not like the other black students. And I'm like, what does that mean? <laughs> um, because as the teacher, you know, had, stereotypes had stereotyped how black children are supposed to be or if I if I switched for a minute and, and wasn't as smart as the teacher thought I should be then like I wasn't behaving the way she whatever she thought so that that's my two cents about stereotypes uh, let me let me jump in here and sort of build uh, on what the rabbi rabbi Lawson was just saying or Sandra was just saying and tie it back to what we were saying earlier about prejudice um, stere and stereotype and the tying stereotypes together. Every prejudice has certain stereotypes associated with it. You know, uh, Jews, rich, uh, and uh, I'll go through those in a minute. Uh, uh, as I said earlier, gays, effeminate, uh, blacks, inarticulate, uh, 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 getting a free ride on affirmative action, um, not smart, not successful, whatever it might be. Um, and I think, and especially since we're focusing on race and anti-Semitism and uh, the, the tension between the two, and the t I think we have to recognize that we wouldn't be having this conversation if there hadn't been, there wasn't, if everything was hunky-dory or terrific or whatever, I don't know if you, what hunky-dory comes from, if you can say that anymore, but in any case. Um, the, racist, the person who was racist, and the truth is, and I've, I've come to understand this, not just in the past six months, but for a long time in my work, it took me a while, but that it's impossible to live in Western society and, and much of uh, uh, the rest of society, but certainly in Western society, European, North American, et cetera, and even South American, without having an element of racism built into you. Um, but the racist looks upon the black person and says, if they move into our neighborhood, there goes the neighborhood. If their kids go to our kids' schools, there goes the school. The racist looks upon the person of color, particularly the black person, as bringing them down. They are to be loathed because they're going to deteriorate. They're going to, they're going to mix with us. That's eugenicism, the science of race, uh, from where much of this stems. In contrast, the anti-Semite looks on the Jew, and, and what's, what's the template of, anti, of the anti-Semitic stereotype that you were asking about, or stereotypes as applied to anti-Semitism? I would say there are four elements. One, something to do with money, something to do with smarts, but not good smarts, conniving, uh, clever, uh, using their smarts in a diabolical or malicious way. And the third one would be punching above their weight. Few in number, but very powerful. Uh, and, and, you know, using that for their own benefit. And the fourth thing is, and this comes straight out of uh, 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 Christian anti-Semitism, and it's, of course, morphed into many different forms, but the Jew is the devil. The Jew is, and the devil in Christian theology is someone who can, who comes and does evil. First of all, the devil is the only one who can harm God, and of course, 
who supposedly uh, committed deicide, but the Jew, of course, Jesus was a Jew, the Jews were Jews, and the Romans actually killed him. But that's a fact. We're not dealing with facts. We're dealing with stereotypes and, and prejudices. Um, and uh, secondly, the devil comes in disguise. So you don't know the devil has been there till he's come and gone and done, done his handiwork, whether it's poisoning the wells, whether today it's George Soros supposedly working behind the scenes to create masses of people coming from south of the border to infiltrate or black people and Muslims coming into Europe to destroy Christian culture. So that, so the Jew, the stereotype of the, of the, the racist stereotype uh, or the stereotype of the black person held by the racist, you punch down. You punch down because they're gonna take you down. Keep them down because they're gonna take us down. Think about it, um, Jesse Owens. When Jesse Owens accomplished his amazing athletic feat, and with Jesse Owens, you can spell feet either way and you'll be right, you know, at the Berlin Olympics. How did the Nazis explain that? How could they explain that he beat, he and Frank Metcalf, he won four, Frank Metcalf won three, wasn't the only African-American black person on the American team to win medals. They said, oh, he is from Africa. And in the eugenicist view of things, the black person is closer on the evolutionary scale to an animal. So even the fastest Aryan couldn't beat a horse. That, that's how they explained it in, in their racial terms. On, so you're punching down. The anti-Semite punches up. The Jew is more powerful, small in number, more powerful, conniving, smarter, punching above their weight, able to work behind the scenes, etc. So the Jew is to be loathed, just like the black person, but the Jew is also to be feared for what they might do to us, whereas the black person is to be feared for how they might bring us down. So every prejudice with each group has stereotypes associated with it, and you can't mix them up. You mix them up, they don't work. Um, and people are so used to them, they're so ingrained into the population that people take them as a truth. That's the problem. It's not the person who's the hater, but the person, I'm sorry to go on so long with this, but I feel so passionately about it, yeah. that it becomes absorbed and you don't even know you have a prejudice. A friend of mine, I'll finish with this anecdote and I apologize for going on so long, but a friend of mine who is a liberal person or considers herself a liberal person was backstage at an opera recently. She got, she knew one of the singers, she'd gone backstage and she said this very uh, large, well-built black man came down the steps and she said, and I assumed he was on the, on the crew that worked in the back of the, the opera. Um, he was one of the singers, he was one of the lead singers, but she admitted, she said, I just looked at him and I assumed that that's who it was. That's a, a prejudicial stereotype that the person has, and they weren't thinking badly, but they just, you make the assumption. I see a Jew, I make the assumption rich. I had my students uh, visiting me one, one at a time. They come over to my house. We sit outside, 10 feet apart, masked, et cetera. Don't get nervous, anyone. Um, but one of them said she had just encountered um, an African-American student, a black student here at Emory, and they were friendly. Uh, and he said, oh, you're, yeah, I've got a lot of Jewish uh, uh, women in my classes, of course, they're all rich. And this was a, a, a Jewish student who was a, a, a scraping by at Emory uh, on scholarship, you know? So it's the, the danger of the stereotype. And I'll stop there and I apologize again. And, and we, we have two other really great sections to dive into. Um, and I, I think it's beautiful that we have such amazing panelists. I know, you know, when you put a rabbi and two professors together, you are exposing yourself to wealth of knowledge, and I don't think an hour and a half would be enough time for us to dive into everything. But um, Dr. Hornsby, I do want you to briefly touch on, um, on how we see stereotypes in media um, and, and, and how that, that, um, that, you know, that can attribute to, or contribute to some of the things that we're seeing. And then right after that, we'll transition into our next section. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, it's, 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 
it is a question on media scholars, what comes first, the representation as it exists in culture or the representation as it exists in media, what is reflecting what, um, you know, because we, we see these things and then we, you know, we see these creations of stereotypical representations and then we consume them and then we recreate them in our own way. So then we have this sort of cycle of stereotypical representation. And, you know, um, Stuart Hall, he's a cultural, studies theorists, he does some really interesting work around representation and representing images and really sort of digs down into stereotypes. He does a lot of work about the stereotypes around black men. Um, and, 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 and that's, you know, if you wanna go look into that, it's really, really important. But I think what, what we find is that stereotypes are easy. Stereotypes are easy to latch onto in media spaces because they're familiar. We are familiar with the stereotypes of Jewish people. Whether we want to admit it or not, we are familiar with that stereotype. And we are familiar with stereotypes of Black people. And here's the other thing, is that those stereotypes have often um, created success for marginalized folks, playing into the stereotypes. I think about um, the work of Tyler Perry, right? And how he consciously made choices to lean into what some people would say stereotypes of black life um, in satirical ways. Um, and he caught a lot of flack within his own community and without. Um, but the backstory of that is that now he owns his own studio. And now he's in a place to be able to sort of decide what sort of images he creates and disseminates into the public. Um, because he is now at a class position and a power position within the industry to do so. So I think when you talk about stereotypes as they exist in media, it's easy to have a very simple conversation about it and to reduce them down to this is positive and this is negative. But I would implore everyone, there's some really interesting thought coming out about double negatives and what is assumed as negative and what is more of a reclaiming of an identity that is ours. I think of the work of Spike Lee. I think of, um, you know, uh, particularly Spike Lee. Um, I think of how we think about reality television and, and more specifically how black women are re represented in reality television. We want the immediate critique is that is stereotypical. It is a negative representation and we should do away with it. What we, fail to do is the same thing a stereotype does and we fail to see the nuance of that of that representation. So while yes, it plays into the representation that all black women are loud and sassy and have an attitude, we don't look at the power dynamics of what's happening um, with those black bodies that we are seeing. So I think that, you know, this is a, only an hour and a half conversation, but I think that the, the danger of trying to combat stereotypes is that we end up doubling down on them. We replace them with another stereotype. And then we're in this cycle of stereotypes. So I think how we disrupt that is that we say, yes, while categorizing people and categorizing identities is something that we do to understand the world, that there is complexity and nuance to everyone. So we need to understand said complexity and nuance just like um, Rabbi Sandra did with us to say, these are my intersecting identities, not just what you see on the screen, right? We, we can see some visible identity markers, but we don't know all of those things about her until we actually talk to her. And so I am always a proponent of conversation and discourse because it is until you were sitting or in a Zoom box or face to face, and you were able to articulate all of the things that make you you, then you can really combat stereotypical thinking in, a, to me, a much more disruptive way. And when we do that, then we start to see complexity and nuance in media representations of different people. Wonderful. Dr. Hornsby, thank you for that response. Um, we're going to move on to the, the next section, the works, to talk about the work that each of you do. Um, and I'll start with a question for Dr. Lipstadt. Um, what do you say to those who deny history, whether it be Holocaust denial or denying that racism is a systemic problem in this country? Oh, you're still on mute. Uh, I don't say much to them uh, unless they're suing me for libel and I have to talk to them. Um, 
but uh, I think what I, I'm going to step back a little. Um, the people who are engaging in Holocaust denial, um, and I think it could be applied to aspects of American history as well, and certainly in terms of enslaved people, et cetera. But, but just to stick with Holocaust denial, my, my main focus, um, for deniers to be right, who would have to be wrong? Survivors? bystanders, the people who lived in the towns, the villages near the camps, near the, sh the shooting sites. Thousands, literally, of historians all over the world. I was not long ago, I was in Japan working with Holocaust scholars. Um, and most of all, uh, the, uh, the perpetrators, the perpetrators who say we did it. You know, so it, it does, it's, a, it's not a denial of history. It's something that makes absolutely no sense. Uh, deniers will sometimes say to you, um, well, you know, if you say to them, well, why, why would the Jews, if, if you've been convinced by them that the Holocaust is, is truly a myth, you might ask them, well, why did the Jews make it up? What's in it for them? And they will give you two answers. They will say, what did the Jews get out of, so to speak, out of the Holocaust? And the answer that people will often give is the state of Israel. It's much more complicated than that. And it's not a direct result, but that's a standard answer. And the second thing is reparations. So they have given an answer that fits right into the mold of, of the anti-Semitic stereotypes, money, conniving, they, the Jews connive to get themselves a state. They made up this big story, made Germany take the blame, made the allies have the Nuremberg laws. So Holocaust denial, what is so clear to me as in the years that I've worked on it and encountered deniers and fought deniers is, is not a denial of history. It's a form of anti-Semitism. And I'm going to leave it to Rabbi Lawson and Professor Hornsby, but it's the same thing when you deny the evils of slavery and enslaved people, of what was done to enslaved people. It's not a mistake. Um, it's it's, it's a, a twisting of history, a prejudicial view of history to reaffirm your own stereotypes. Absolutely. Um, uh... And and as you speak of of uh, you know Sierra mentions the Holocaust denial and people denying racism, um, we see it often when someone makes a statement Black Lives Matter. Um, and so I want to transition as we talk about the work as we're dealing with racism into to a, a small conversation um, about that. So Black Li Black Lives Matter is often seen in the media, especially social media, um, as a phrase for bringing awareness to the oppression and the inequity of Black citizens in the United States of America. Um, Black Lives Matter Global Network is the official organization with an atypical structure, which is very difficult for some of us to, to try to explain. Um, so Dr. Hornsby, I wanna hear from you. Is it possible to separate the phrase um, and the movement, uh, if you will, from the organization? And then um, Dr. Lipstad and, 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 and Rabbi Lawson, um, I want to hear from you um, what your response is to the Jewish community. Some, some folks in the Jewish community being reluctant um, support black to support Black Lives Matter or, or to say Black Lives Matter, um, and and some of the reasons as to 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 why that that might be occurring. Um, I think uh, this is a good example of how message is complex, right? So what Black Lives Matter has come to represent through various iterations of message creation and consumption is highly contested, especially right now. Um, there's always the thought, does my articulation of this phrase tether me to the perceptions of the movement and the politics of the organization? It's not just simply saying Black Lives Matter. There are all these other factors involved. And I think part of it is a matter of timing. Um, and just as sort of intersectionality entered into the popular discourse in a very specific way and then morphed into a more generalized version, I think that Black Lives Matter will do the same. Um, so as more and more people are visibly articulating the phrase, it becomes in some ways disconnected from the movement in the organization. So can a person separate the phrase from the movement or organization in terms of personal use? Sure. 
I can say Black Lives Matter and for myself know that that does not connect to any other thing except for the fundamental belief that I have that Black Lives Matter. Can the public writ large do the same? Honestly, right now, I'm not sure because there is a political agenda to tie that to a very specific um, ideology that feels like it is pr protecting America and democracy. Um, so it, it is a very political space. So when people do make the choice to say it, they have they understand that it comes with the weight of all those things. Um, Pew did a study in June and found though that most people when they say the term, they're not saying it as a way to connect to um, the organization. They are saying it in solidarity that Black Lives Matter. I think for me, and I will end on this, I think I'm much more fascinated by the way that the language, um, that language created to address social injustice and inequity is stringently more scrutinized than language that maintains the dominant ideology, right? For example, the current discourse around de deconstructing the nuance of what it means to say Black Lives Matter and what you're connected to and, and what you are affiliated with and do you know this and that is framed by the opponents of the movement as protecting US ideals of patriotism and democracy. While those very same people view deconstructing slavery and the Holocaust as divisive. Oh, to talk about that is divisive. We cannot do that. That, that, why are you bringing that up? So it seems like it's much more about retaining power than it is about addressing inequities and injustice for all. Um, and then I'll, to close, I'll say, nothing is above critique. No one, no theoretical framework, no ideology, no standpoint is above critique. And there is always a way to think deeper about inclusion in our social justice efforts even as we seek to address very specific racial issues. Um, so I think that we always have to, to, to keep that in mind. Uh, Wendell, I know we're, we're short on time, but I just want to jump in here and give two examples because I think you asked about Jews and reluctance yes. to accept it. I think, you know, when I first heard the term Black Lives Matter, my, my, my knee jerk reaction was all lives matter. Excuse me, all lives matter, but, um, then I thought about it, and I talked to some of my uh, black colleagues and others, and I, you know, you realize that the moment we are right now in the United States is a moment when black lives, it's not that they're more oppressed now, it's just that we're all walking around with movie cameras in our, in our pockets so we can take pictures of what's been going on for years, and we're more aware of it. But I think for Jews, Jews, for, here are two ways for Jews to understand it. Uh, I'm speaking to you from Atlanta, and as, you, as the people at the consulate well know, about a year and a half ago, we had an incident at Emory uh, towards the end of the year where student dorms were, one, in one dorm, students' rooms were leafleted with eviction notices. You know, we're evicting you, maybe Sierra was still on campus then, but we're evicting you as if you're on the West Bank. It was an anti-Israel action. People, now the word went out incorrectly that it was Jewish students who were targeted. It was everybody in the dorm who was targeted. Uh, but what happened in the community I live, which is adjacent to campus and happens to have a very large traditional Jewish population, was a Friday, it happened on a Thursday. By Friday, there were signs in, people, in front of people's houses saying, we stand with Emory's Jewish students. Um, as one of my students, non-Jew, who studied with me a lot, uh, came to me and said, well, because she passed it on her way to school, don't they stand with all Emory students? I said, yes, but at the moment, their perception is that Jewish students are under specific attack. And that's why they're writing, they're doing that. The second anecdote, and I'll be very quick, about a year and a half ago, Speaker Pelosi uh, wanted to introduce a resolution, a non-binding resolution, uh, condemning anti-Semitism in the House of Representatives. One would hope that it binds everyone, but that's not often the case. Um, and uh, a number of people in the Democratic Party said, no, it should condemn racism, it should condemn homophobia, and it should be more all-inclusive. I was happened to be up on Capitol Hill then, I was asked to meet with a number of members of Congress, um, both those who were supporting it as the speaker had introduced it and those who wanted a broader iteration. And I said, look, no one, this was right at the height of a number of anti-Semitic uh, events. 
I said, no one is saying that these other hatreds are any less significant, but right now we're facing anti-Semitism and why can't we condemn anti-Semitism? And the same way right now we're facing in this country, it's not to say there isn't anti-Semitism. Uh, I'm gonna be an expert witness in the Charlottesville case on anti-Semitism and the intersection between, uh, speaking of intersection, between racism and anti-Semitism to unite the right people. But right now we're facing in our country a recognition of an epidemic of uh, uh, destruction of black lives, attack on black lives, and that's what it means. So, you know, so just to add to this, um, one thing I want to, I just want to say that, and, I, and I, I do get asked this a lot, you know, first of all, the phrase Black Lives Matter is a protest chant. It's a call to action started, you know, after the verdict of, uh, after uh, George Zimmerman was acquitted of killing Trayvon Martin, and then, um, and then really took hold uh, during the protest of Ferguson. So there's that piece. Um, you can add after that everything that Elizabeth said. <laughs> and, um, and for, uh, for Jews who, focus or I'll say hyper focus on anti-Semitism in the black community um, and not wanting to support Black Lives Matter or hesitant to support Black Lives Matter. I, I invite them to look at their own their own racism related to that. Because black people are, are no more or less to be anti-Semitic than anybody else in our society. Our society is anti-Semitic because our society is largely Christian and, and you know the origins of anti-Semitism come from Christianity. But to focus on, you know, the anti-Semitism of, of a few in the in black who were in the Black Lives Matter movement, but not call out larger anti-Semitism in the, the broader, a broader society, you know, caused to, makes me question, you know, you know, where is this coming from and racism. And so for Jews who are, you know, concerned about saying Black Lives Matter, you know, I also am aware that many of them do not have relationships with Black people. And so building relationships with people who are different, um, and many of our society don't even know what is anti-Semitic. It, it's so ingrained in our culture, just like racism is ingrained in our culture. And so the movement for Black Lives has removed any anti-Semitic language largely because Jews stayed in relationships with members of the Black community and said, look, this is problematic. I love you, but you, this is wrong. And so um, that kind of relationship, building relationships has gone a long way. And that's what we need to do. Instead of just saying, oh, I can't support Black Lives Matter because a few people are anti-Semitic. Well, there's, there's anti-Semitism in the Black community for the same reasons there's anti-Semitism in the larger, the, our larger society. Thank you all um, for those responses. And again, I know it's a small window to unpack so much. Um, and we're excited that we'll be doing this as a series. This is not the end of the series. We'll be tackling other topics as well. Um, but I do wanna switch into our next section um, where we talk a little bit about the worth um, and the worth of community and allyship and, and, and things like that. So um, just, just recently the consulate, um, Morehouse College, uh, uh, Morehouse College's King Chapel and, and uh, Spill the Honey Foundation um, hosted an online screening of, of Shared Legacies, um, um, the African-American Jewish Civil Rights Alliance. Um, and then we had a, a wonderful student discussion, student-based discussion um, about the documentary and, and about allyship, et cetera. Um, on a scale of one to 10, and, and I just wanna hear your number responses from all three of you, how important is it that we look to pass alliances um, to collectively combat white supremacist ideology? And when I say white supremacist ideology, I'm talking about racism, I'm talking about, you know, anti-Semitism and, and, and so much more nationalism, all, all other types of things. Well, I'm gonna break the rules and not just give you a number. I knew it. <laughs> it's very important. Um, but I think what's really important is to recognize that alliance, but also for Jews to recognize, not all Jews, but those Jews who have built-in racism, to recognize it and for blacks to recognize your built-in anti-Semitism and to address it, it calls for hard work. And, and, and you know what, you cheated, but I also cheated as well. There is a second part to that question um, and, and, and Dr. Hornsby and, and, and Rabbi Lawson, um, you know, Dr. Lipstadt has done a great job at adding to that, but how- Breaking how, the rules. 
it, you know what, we don't get far if we don't break the rules. You know, I, I went to Morehouse and they taught us to be radical. Um, and, and, and so, but what I, what I do want to know is what can we do, just very briefly, because we're, we're about to start taking questions in a, in a few minutes, um, what can we do to strengthen this allyship? So one thing I think, yeah, I agree. It's so, so, so important. Um, and I'm just adding, not taking away, but I want to add to what Deborah said, which is those relationships, our allyship is important, but we also really need to start telling the truth about those relationships. We highlight, you know, the Freedom Riders. Um, we highlight uh, Joshua Heschel. Yes, Joshua Heschel, Abraham Joshua Heschel, and Dr. King had a real friendship. But we often don't talk about you know, the, the rabbis who were on the front lines and then going back to their communities and the communities are saying like, why are you out there with black people? <laughs> we have, you know, work to do here. And so, and, and also this narrative of what happened in the 60s and this large gap to today. And so, you know, I do, I, you know, I, I do love the narratives and the stories that we tell in the 50s and 60s, but we also need to be real about the relationships and how it has fallen apart. Um, and you know, start start to really tell that. But yes, it's it's so 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 important. Thank you, Dr. Hornsby. You want to take a, a thirty minute stab at it? Thirty minute, thirty seconds. Thirty seconds. I yeah. Even... Sorry. You know what? Um... <laughs> I think that's. I think they said everything that I would say. I think that you know, recognizing and understanding and teaching histories because there are some people who don't know this history who don't know the um, histories of the civil rights and Jewish involvement. Like there are some people who literally do not know that. So I do think that um, always bring that into the conversation, but also um, like Rabbi Sandra said, having real conversations and being honest and creating spaces where you can be honest and not feel attacked for your honesty when you are legitimately trying to learn and to, to be a part. Um, I think, especially I would say on, um, for black people, um, not all of them, I don't speak for everyone, but I think that there can be an idea that if you're gonna come to the table, you need to know everything to come to the table. Like you need to have done your homework before you got here so that we can, cause we don't have time, we got stuff to do. And I think there needs to be a space where you allow people to learn, a space where you allow people to make mistakes, to say the wrong thing, um, and to really, um, you know, to think about, they came here to be a part of something. How can we, just like was mentioned about Black Lives Matter, because people came to the table and probably had some hard conversations, change was made in the movement. So then how can we sort of recreate that process in a varied situations to really create allyship? Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, as we discuss Black Jewish relations, there also appears to be a large number of Black Jews, Jews of color, and Jews of African descent who feel disinherited. And I, I want to ask you, Rabbi Sandra, um, as a Black and Jewish rabbi, what can be done within the Jewish community to address this issue? <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a big one. Um, you know, I do, I do, I work with young people, um, many, and many of the young, many young people have found me online, and that's not just young people, but also older people. You know, the Jewish community, which, you know, has come, has come a long way in a very short period of time, um, but we need to start telling the truth about our racial demographics, um, and what, um, what we look like. First of all, you know, if you go, if you read the book of Exodus, the Torah is very clear. We were, you know, Erev Rav, a mixed multitude of people who left, left Egypt, you know, and, and it talks about, you know, the people who had animals and, and um, um, you know, that just sort of, you know, the, they brought their livestock, you know, and this is, you know, we're fleeing Egypt um, and uh, we're leaving the narrow place in Israel and on, and follow, I'd like to say following a guy who hears voices uh, in, the, in the desert. Um, and I, that text to me, and the reason I brought it up is, is a reminder that we've always have been and always will be in Erev Rav. So those people who left Egypt, I mean, imagine the budding interfaith relationships that might have started before they fleed. And, um, you know, like one guy's like, I got to go follow, I got to go follow Moses. And like the other person's like, I love you. I'm going with you, you know, and rich people went, uh, poor people went. And so we take that into today. And depending on which of the three studies you looked at in the last few years, you know, 15 to 10 to 15, 10, 
12 to 20 percent of the American Jewish population self-identifies as Jews of color. And so that doesn't, that may not mean that you have Jews of color in your community, but it does mean that we are more racially diverse and more ethnically diverse than the stories that we tell. And that's not new, it's just that, that that's just the, the story we tell. So if we keep holding on to these, I, this idea that Jews, which I've had people say this to me, all Jews came from Brooklyn, um, or um, all Jews came from Eastern Europe, um, we are doing damage to, let's say, the white couple that comes in to check out your synagogue, but you don't know they have a brown child. And when you insult them, they won't come back. Um, when you walk in to check, or to, like walk in to say Kaddish, um, and somebody assumes that you're not Jewish. Or in my case, for example, I was, when I worked for the Anti-Defamation League, I was a guest speaker for Senator Isaacson, I'm not sure what his, I can't remember his name, when he was a senator there, and it was a fundraiser, and I, and I was the, the guest speaker, somebody thought that I was the help. So, um, you know, just, you know, and um, we need to do that because we are hurting our young people who, and, and not just our young people, but people who want to be Jewish and want to come into our communities and, and the Jewish community doesn't even understand that they are turning them away and they are insulting them. And so we need to start really doing some internal work um, so that we don't turn off young people, we don't turn off young black and brown people um, or anyone who is different than whatever we are telling us, ourselves that a Jew looks like. All right. Um, uh, we have a, a bunch of great questions looking, l coming into our, our chat. Um, and we, we're actually going to bring on one of the questions on, on, on one of the people who are asking questions on screen, but this is a last question. Um, I'll ask you all to keep it as brief as possible, your response. Um, I hear people say all the time, I'm not racist. I'm not anti-Semitic. Is that enough? Or is there a need to be anti-racist and, and, and against all hate? Um, so... Any one of you take a stab at it, um, and, and we'll yes. head on to taking questions, uh, answers. It's not from enough. It's not enough. There's no bite. When it comes to evil, Ellie Wiesel said it all the time. Uh, Professor Kennedy says, so many people say it. Uh, there's no neutrality when it comes to evil. I'm not getting involved. Uh, you know, the Leviticus 19, Alta Amod al Damreach, don't stand idly by saying I'm not a racist, I'm not an anti-Semite, anti and doing nothing is worse than not saying anything. And, and just to add to that, I think that one of the challenges is, is that the idea of racist racism, the idea that we hold up in our minds is, you know, the KKK, the neo-Nazi lynching, and yes, those, and slavery, yes, perfect examples of racism, but racism, just like whiteness, has evolved over time, and so if we keep holding up those as the only examples of racism, it causes people to, to say, I'm not racist, because in their mind, racist is the most, is the worst thing you could possibly call someone and but we need to be real and, and i actually tweeted this and got a lot of attention interestingly enough you know i i believe that like similarly other people do that you are either racist or anti-racist those are the choices there's no not racist you and and when i say anti-racist that means you are actively working every day physically emotionally to rid yourselves of the stereotypes and ideas that you've been taught about marginalized people in our society Thank you um, for those responses. We're gonna go ahead and switch over to the audience. Um, we do have one question coming in from Dr. Adrian Jones, who's a professor of political science at Morehouse College. Um, she's actually one of my professors and, and my race law professor at that. So interesting that the discussion that we're having. Um, Dr. Jones, take it away. Hi, how are you? Um, would love to thank you for this incredible discussion that you've been having. And um, as an educator myself, I was wondering your thoughts about how to have these discussions. To Dr. Hornsby's point about uh, black students often being exasperated, um, to Rabbi Sandra's point about um, speaking too quickly and perhaps pigeonholing people in an offensive way, and um, to Dr. Lipstadt's point about people wanting not, it not being enough to be uninvolved. Um, but these are sensitive issues that sometimes people aren't ready to talk about, how do you create that space? Do you have some techniques? Um, you know, how do you go about engaging people in the classroom and on the street? I, 
I'll just hop in real quick. I am a firm believer in auto ethnography as method. So again, centering your, your narrative in the larger um, picture. Because what I find when I teach race and gender is I have them sort of write how they see themselves. And through okay. class, we constantly reference back to what they said. It's not Dr. Hornsby saying, you're white and you're this, you're black and you're this. As I am talking about how race is constructed through language and social interaction, how identity intersect, and they start seeing, yeah, I said that I was this faith politic and I was raised in this socioeconomic status and I have these types of parents. They start to understand that as I am saying these terms that they have maybe have heard in a contested space, that they're not, that it does apply to them. Or when I start talking about how um, race, um, how discrimination works in, in intersecting ways and how it, how it functions in the workplace and how when we're talking about being anti-racist in an organization, that's a very real thing. They start to think about, oh, that's kind of like that story I wrote in my paper where this thing happened to me or I saw this thing happen to my friend and I didn't know what to do about it, but I kind of thought it was wrong or I saw it happen and I didn't think about it. And what's wild are uh, the students who don't think about it until the end and realize that not thinking about their identity is a privilege in and of itself. And I don't have to get into deep dives about privilege. They realize, you know what, Dr. Hornsby, I didn't even write anything about me being white or anything about me being Christian or anything about me being middle class or wealthy in my sort of how I see myself. And now I realize that that is something that everyone else in the class seem to identify their um, their religious belief or their uh, you know their gender identity, and I just didn't even think about that. So I know for me, especially teaching at a small teaching school in South Louisiana, um, with a very conservative bent, I have to be very careful on how I frame those discussions um, for myself. But also, I think allowing the students as much as I can to come into that space on their own um, through autoethnography is a very powerful teaching tool. So what I, what I do and, and my approach is, cause you know, I, I serve as a rabbi and, um, and so I'm, I'm trying to get what I feel like getting people into their heart space and not their head space. And so I approach these discussions in a similar way that I, that I do with our, with our liturgy, our sudor. So our prayers that we offer in the morning, um, is full of gratitude. You have, you know, thank you, God, for breathing life into me. You have, you, you know, uh, God, you created me pure. Um, you, you know, breathe, all this stuff about, you know, like blessings of gratitude. And then we move into our, our call to prayer. And I'm, I'm not joking. There's a lot of like liturgy before we even get to our call to prayer or we're focusing on gratitude. And then we get to our call to prayer. And, you know, I believe that this was, this was written this way so that you could have all this gratitude so that you could be open to receiving. And so when I talk um, about this, and I do talk in mostly, well, mostly white spaces, is uh, this method that I actually learned from one of my teachers, Rabbi Mordecai Liebling, who actually learned it from Joanna Macy. And uh, I don't, I've never studied with Joanna Macy, but I can tell you what I've learned from uh, Rabbi Mordecai Liebling. So what I do is I start off with, what are we grateful for today? And we, when we, we talk a lot about gratitude. And then I move into sort of acknowledging pain, uh, letting people talk about the, the pain of racism or letting pe people talk about the pain of not understanding racism, or I wasn't taught this in this school, or that you can't sit, you know, you can't just sit idly by, we have to do something. So it's sort of creating a container for that. Um, and then I, and after, it's, it's about 15, maybe 20 minutes, depending, after that, then I talk about our society. And I feel like by then people are really open to uh, receiving, you know, what I'm talking about, either my own personal experiences or experiences of Jews of color or sort of what's happening in our, in our society right now. And then I move into now that you have listen to me, what is, what is coming up for you right now? And so I don't approach this like, and when I, as a rabbi, I'm not like trying to lecture you and tell you that you're wrong. I want people to think, and I want people to be in their heart space, you know, so that they can really try to 
not have an intellectual answer for this, but like an open answer, so a heart answer, so that they can we can start to move together as a society and heal ourselves. Um, I, I'm going to take it on a much lower level. I fight the urge to say to the person, "You're a blank." racist or you're an anti-Semite, you know. I have come to realize that nobody ever changed their opinion by being told they're an idiot or a prejudicial person. But in my heart, that's what I want. I want to clobber them. So I fight that urge. And I, what I try to do, it's the same thing with my example of the uh, We Stand With Emory's Jewish Students or the, the bill that was, I try to find and, so, and usually I find it at two o'clock in the morning after having encountered it the night before I sit bolt upright in bed and I know exactly what I should have said. But I try to, to transfer the situation into a situation where they find themselves. Just like Jews were upset when there was opposition to Speaker Pelosi's resolution condemning anti-Semitism because why, why do we have to water it down or it seemed to them a watering down? Why can't you just say anti-Semitism is wrong? So when someone says to me, I'm bothered by L Black Lives Matter, I say it's a similar kind of thing. I look, I'm a rationalist, I guess, and I look for those, those situations where someone can put themselves in and sort of say, oh, I get it. Thank you all so much for, for answering Dr. Uh, Jones' question. Dr. Jones, thank you for joining us. Um, we're going to bring in a nod um, and continue with some of the questions that we received from the audience. Thank you, Dr. Jones. All right. Um, and so we have some really great questions. Um, this, this question actually comes from um, Elliot Clark, uh, Corp. Uh, he says, in, in the contemporary context of current events, can one honestly acknowledge one's prejudices without be, being labeled a racist? And I'll ask that one of the panelists responds. Since I know the quest questioner, I'll jump in. I think you can. Um, and of course, you have to be in a safe space. A number of people have mentioned a safe space where if I'm going to acknowledge my prejudices, they're not going to be rammed down my throat. But I'm, I'm, I'm being honest. Help me work them through. Awesome. And then we have a question from um, Adam Goldstein. He says, as a white Jewish Zionist liberal man of privilege, how do I best combat a stereotype among those who are not in three or more of these circles? speaking out against anti-Semitism and racism and anti-Zionism and white privilege all at the same time from left and right. Rabbi uh, Lawson, you wanna take a stab? Um, that was kind of, I'll, I'll try to answer what I, I think that I heard and hopefully this goes a long way. I think one of the challenge, one of the challenges, and this may not be his question, but I think one of the challenges is, you know, that, that I, hear a lot is sort of centering the Jewish experience and the experience of, of, of the marginalized groups. So, um, you know, if you are in a working with people who, or if you're working with, with Black people, for example, um, and you are centering the experience of Jews, that, that may not be the best place to do that. Um, and so I'll just leave it at that. Thank you. Um, another great question coming from um, Jesse and Dr. Hornsby, maybe you can take a stab at it. It's just, how do you tie all of your efforts together? Um, and, and, and I can attest to this, I see a lot of fatigue around focusing on one single issue at a time when intersectionality is so important. How do we get better um, as an ally at recognizing intersectionality and helping on all fronts? I mean, I think you have to talk to people. <laughs> I mean, it's like my gut, my gut reaction to everything is that, you know, I am a social constructionist at heart. I believe that language constructs reality. And the more that we talk about things, the more that we are able to disrupt um, the, the things that we need to disrupt. And we are able to sort of platform the things that need to be platformed in a way that is, you know, that works towards whatever social justice efforts we are moving towards for all people. Um, I also deeply believe in the work of inclusion. So I think to be inclusive means you have to focus on, um, you have to have a lens that allows you to focus on all things, but not all at the same time. 
Um, I always use the example, my, my anecdotes tend to be about children because I have a lot of them. I have a lot of children and I don't love any of them any less, but if one needs me to give them the Wi-Fi passcode and one has a broken arm, the broken arm takes precedent over the Wi-Fi passcode. It doesn't mean that my love care concern for any of the other ones is any less, but in that moment, I need to focus my attention there. And so I think if you sort of take that lens, which I mean, you can call it intersectional, you can call it inclusive. I mean, you could, you could apply a, a lot of terminology to it, but you know, as these things pop up and we are seeing sustained injustice against a group of people, I think it, it behooves all of us to focus our energies there for that moment, knowing that this is a long fight, that it is a marathon and not a sprint, and that there's going to be another probably a series of injustices against another group that's going to need all of us to rally to that. And so I don't think it's an either or, it's a both and. And, and I think learning how to operate in that mindset helps you battle the fatigue of the battle because the, the, the battle is wearisome regardless of how you face it. Thank you so much. Um, unfortunately, the, the time um, has come for us to wrap things up. I cannot say thank you enough for all of you, uh, to all of you, um, uh, the panelists and, and, and to our wonderful Consul General um, in, in Atlanta. Um, th this topic is one that, you know, is one that's difficult to have. It's one that requires a lot of attention. It requires the foundation of understanding these terminologies, the words, understanding um, the work that's happening, you know, um, between us and, and, and also understanding the worth, of, worth of, of, of being allies and partners in our efforts. Um, so on behalf of the Consulate General of Israel to the Southeast, um, thank you all so much. Um, I am now going to turn things over. We're going to hear from one of my very good friends, um, who is the 36th um, chapel president um, at Morehouse College. Um, not only is Gabriel the chapel assistant president, he is also the president of the Senate. He is the, the vice president of the Student Government Association. Um, and he's uh, vice president um, of, of the um, YPD for um, the AME Church. So Gabriel, take us away and wrap us up. All right, I can definitely do that. Uh, thank you, before I begin, thank you so much for including me on this venture, this effort for us to sit down and have a courageous conversation to the panelists. Um, what wonderful and insightful things you brought to us tonight. And uh, it is my hope that I'll be able to wrap all of that up and give a charge not only to us who are in this setting together, but those who will be watching this video or any later taping of this initiative. So um, the words, the works, and the worth. I want to hone in on one specific thing, the work. We have enjoyed listening to the shared wisdom, perspectives, an understanding of three knowledgeable subject matter experts, Dr. Hornsby, Rabbi Lawson, Dr. Lipstadt, and, and we really have been gifted uh, with this amount of knowledge. And at the start of this dialogue, we were reminded of the power of words. Rabbi Lawson, Dr. Hornsby, and Dr. Lipstadt, you spoke truth to power. And on behalf of the Martin Luther King Jr. International Chapel at Morehouse College, thank you. Thank you for imparting seeds that have the ability to bring forth fruit in harvest. If we have those who are willing to take up this hard work, it's not easy. The conversations are difficult, but they need to be had. And it's not just enough to say you aren't racist. That's not enough. It's not enough to say you are, are not someone against um, racism. That's, that's not enough. When you see something, we have a moral imperative to say something. And I charge you and those listening to do the work. It is my hope that tonight's discussion serves as a launching pad to collective action as moral cosmopolitans, a term coined by Dean Lawrence Edward Carter Sr. That we allow ourselves to be full citizens of what Dr. King called the beloved community. May we understand that we are lock stitched into the fabric of life that we cannot escape. May we commit to being selfless and hopeful. I charge you to step outside of yourself and see others for who they are. At the beginning of our time together, it was spoken about prejudice, which is a prejudgment 
without listening. I know who you are. I see you for what you really are. And we cannot have a conversation about who you feel you are. I charge us all to listen more. Carl Rogers said, we think we listen, but very rarely do we listen with real understanding or a hope to achieve common ground. How do we put these thoughts into action? How, how are these actionable items uh, follow through in our lives? It's simple. Find like-minded people, organize, and do the work. Create safe spaces where this work can happen. And if you're the only one, stand firm and stand true in that. I charge you to continue to make room for those pushed on the margins. I charge us all to wrestle with those who wish to oppress us and never give an inch where they would like to take a mile. The time is now, and it's on all of us to nourish the seeds that have been provided tonight. Make no mistake, this is a difficult charge. This is a difficult imperative, and it will make you uncomfortable. It's hard to do. Whether you're 20 or 75, it's a difficult task to take on. And I'm not telling you to continue the same system that has kept us going in circles for decades. On the contrary, I am saying strengthen our communities so that we can brace the winds of the storm called racism and anti-Semitism. I will require that we dig into our innermost selves and remove the weeds of our own negative prejudices, biases, issues, and preconceived notions because we have them too. In efforts to become liberators, let's ensure that we are not oppressing someone else. If we allow this to happen, if we begin with self-reflection, we can begin to tackle the vile garden of hate that has embedded our society. At Morehouse, our motto is, et facta est lux, and then there was light. I charge you to call light out of dark places of racism and hatred and bigotry. Call it out until your last breath. Call it out. Understand the worth of allyship and community. Let us always vow to support the good of all people. When we see our friends hurting and suffering, let us not reason with remaining silent or cower in fear. This means being comfortable with acknowledging and unapologetically saying, Black Lives Matter. As we close, let us courageously recall the mantra of the scholars who have walked the sacred grounds of Morehouse College, a place that I call home. I got my brothers back. I got my sisters back. I got my neighbors back. What hurts them hurts me. I charge you to call it out. I charge you to wake up, get up, and stand up for what is right. With all of this in mind, let us move onward together against all hate. Thank you. Thank you, Gabriel. And again, thank all of you for joining us tonight. Um, a recording of tonight's session, as well as other sessions that we've be ha been having and, and future webinars, um, you'll find on our Facebook page. Um, and you can find that at Israel Atlanta. Um, and one of the things that we're excited about, we are in partnership with an amazing organization um, um, Spill the Honey Foundation, and, and we've been doing discussions with them about shared legacies. So I leave you all um, with the trailer of, of their actual, um, of the work that, that we'll be working on. Um, and I ask that you stay tuned. We'll be emailing you some of the other opportunities that are, that are coming forth. That being said, take care and good night. an African proverb that says that the lions don't tell their stories, the hunters will get all the credit. I'm telling you the story now because you're a young lion and lions. My great grandfather had been in slavery and it goes across generations. You just don't get rid of it simply because there are no chains on you. The effects of slavery are still very prominent just as the effects of the Holocaust are still very prominent amongst our brothers and sisters in the Jewish community. The Jewish people have the DNA in their soul to look up close to what happened to African Americans after slavery. We came to the South, young Jews, rabbis, many of them refugees from Nazi Germany, 
We hear Dr. King quoting the prophets. That was extraordinary. It made us proud. Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel said, the future of America will depend on how it responds to Dr. King. It was the work that Dr. King had spoken for, you know, fairness, equality against anti-Semitism and sort of freedom for Soviet Jews. A large Jewish presence in the civil rights movement was evident almost from the beginning. Well, Stan Levinson and Harry Wachtell were lawyers who were working with Dr. King. They were advisors, marchers, fundraisers. They were in the thick of things. Many Jewish students worked all across the South. And I will never, ever forget three young men, Ann Goodman, Micka Scherner, and James Shady. Birmingham is bombing him. We all know the Exodus is the central narrative of our redemption. And here is a modern situation. Shall we do nothing? We could not have gotten anywhere had not Protestants, Catholics, and Jews showed up from all over the world. Rabbi Yakim Prince spoke immediately before Dr. King. The most shameful and the most tragic problem is silence. The civil rights challenges of our time, the human rights challenges of our day, they hang on me. They hang on you. They hang on who? They hang on us. We all need to get together to find out the bigger picture. Those who have been stepped upon to lead the way. It's all about our humanity. And if we don't figure out a way truly to work together, we'll just be like hamsters on a wheel. The systemic oppression and issues will just continue. There are too many people living in fear. Your Rabbi Hersher and Wonders King Jr. were here today to think they would be saying, we need to pull 